Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke in the 14th chapter. Listen for God's word to you. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete that tower. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of the scriptures. To God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. Will you please be seated? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Large crowds were following Jesus. Who were the people in the crowd? I suspect there were those who saw this as a time of entertainment. Gosh, uh, Jesus was the best entertainment going at the time. And I suspect there were some who were there for the benefits. Some in the crowd probably wanted healing for themselves, if not for themselves, for members of their families. The blind and the lame, and those with diseases, they were in the crowd. And it's apparent from the text that there were those in that crowd who were considering perhaps being a disciple of Jesus. It's akin to the ancient days when kings went forth to war. The entire group of soldiers would go forth, but there were the camp followers. There were those who were cooks, not employed by the army. There were those who washed clothes, maybe twice a year. There were those who acted as doctors for as ancient medicine, as far as ancient medicine was concerned. There were those who entertained, but they were not members of the army. In fact, during the Middle Ages, I've been reading a book on the Third Crusade, Entire tent cities where the armies were stationed with street names in the tent city and business districts in the tent city. 
but none of them were members of their army. And all these crowds keep following and Jesus around, and he turns to them and says to them, whoever does not hate the father or mother, in fact, he goes to include the entire family. If you do not hate them, you cannot be my disciple. As a matter of fact, if you do not, do not hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. If you do not give up all your possessions, you cannot be my disciple. How do we hear that? We who live as citizens of the wealthiest nation ever to grace this planet. How do we hear that? Those of us who are part of the prosperity cult, how do we hear it? Well, often we try to infuse a little bit of that prosperity cult at, into the readings of the words of the scriptures. Well, they're not really meaning that. The call to follow Christ and become a disciple. How do we hear that word hate? Whenever, when I was growing up, I would use the word hate. My father would say, you know, hate is a strong word. Can't you picture it? What if I were to go out there and change the sign out front of our building so all could see it. To be a disciple of Jesus, you must learn to hate. I don't think they would be knocking down the doors. Well, they're not knocking down the doors anyway. We could give it a try. Most scholars believe that Jesus is using a literary device called hyperbole. And that is where you take an exaggerated thing to make critical a point. Jesus is calling us by using that word hate to evaluate our priorities in this life. It is a very human thing for us to sacrifice for our priorities. We sacrifice for our families. We sacrifice for our loved ones. We sacrifice for our education. And we sacrifice paying for our children's education. Athletes know this, whether it is high school or at the collegiate level or at the professional level. They know the term sacrifice. Not only are they required to take time out of their day to practice with the team, there are other times that they have to go to the weight room. Or they have to work on their cardiovascular by training. And then the coaches have the audacity to, requ to request that they sacrifice what they eat. No more Twinkies. No more cupcakes. They must have a balanced, nutritious diet all for the love of the game. Those who start <clears throat> new businesses know the term sacrifice. At first, they 
every bit of the profit they make, they try to feed it back into the business. And most of us know that the rule of life, if we are not willing to sacrifice for these things, we better accept that failure is most likely to follow. But to sacrifice to be a disciple of Christ. Well, you see, I already gave it the office. I've already sacrificed enough for my family. Anyway. Things of God should be free, shouldn't they? Our God is a giving God. We come to God to get. Don't talk to me about sacrifice. But then again, we sacrifice for our priorities, don't we? I am reading a large tome on the Underground Railroad. And if you have forgotten, the Underground Railroad was the means through which the abolitionists in the North were able to take those human beings enslaved in the despicable institution of slavery and move them, sneak them north of the Mason-Dixon line. And each one that would lead the group of slaves north to escape bondage, that person was called the conductor in the Underground Railroad. And in this particular book, there was a meeting of slaves, and it had to happen after midnight when nobody was awake because it was not uh, legal for them to gather together in a group unless they were under the taskmaster's watch, the conductor of the Underground Railroad would meet with them between the hours of 12 and 3 a.m. And the conductor always asked, are you willing to sacrifice for your freedom? I can't answer that for you. For as things worked out, if they were caught as a runaway slave, and there was a good possibility they would be caught, they were beaten to within an inch of their life, or if they felt like they would be a third, further threat to runaway slaves, they were slaughtered. Is your freedom worth the sacrifice? was the question. Some said yes. Some said no. Some said, let me think about it. But sacrifice to be a disciple of Christ? I thought this stuff about Jesus and Christ was a gift of free grace? And I would say to you, yes, there's grace in these words of Jesus. It is the grace that would have us evaluate the direction of our lives. Whether our priorities are spot on or whether we have placed priorities on something of lesser value. Have we placed our priorities in something that is permanent? Or are we placing our values and priorities in something that will be transient? Do we place them on things that last? Or things that are here today and gone tomorrow? And I call that grace. Evaluation 
of where we are in life is a gift. Sir Thomas Mallory of the 15th century he wrote a book called The Death of Arthur, talking about King Arthur of Britain. It does not read like Monty Python. It is much more serious. And King Arthur is trying to, to unite all of Britain into one kingdom instead of warring factions and districts at part of England. And finally, we know of the Knights of the Round Table and all the things that gifts that they brought. And we, we remember Guinevere and all the wonderful stories about their love. And then the betrayal. And in Mallory's account of this mythical character of Arthur, when he has united Britain, he falls into a state of despair. He is on the verge of dying, and the knights of the round table are quite concerned. What can we do? And nothing seemed to help. He needs a quest. And that's where we get the quest for the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus drank out of. That search for something transcendent was what revived King Arthur. Jesus is saying in this text, evaluate your life. Are the things for which you sacrifice lasting? Or are they fleeting? Jesus is not saying that we should not love our families nor love our friends. He's not saying that life is not important. They are. Jesus from the cross. In the Gospel of John, he looks down from the cross and sees Mary, his mother, and tells John, his disciple, to take Mary into John's home. And she will be a mother to you and you a son to her. These things are important. But so many things in our lives are not lasting. And Johnny Cash in his last song that he sings it was made um, it was filmed it's entitled I Hurt Myself Today. And it is filmed in his home. It is the last thing, that song that he sang. It's quite sad. And it pans around his living room. And you see pictures of children in June, Carter Cash, who has preceded him in death. You see all the gold albums that he has won through sales of his records. But the theme of the song goes something like, All the things I've loved have gone away. Jesus is facing Jerusalem in death. Jesus has embraced his mortality. And for Jesus, it has clarified many things. And I think today there will come a time in everybody's life that's sitting here this morning. And we will be on our deathbeds. 
No, I don't want to think about that. You need to think about that. It is important to think about that. And we will look around and we will see our immediate family and, and we will see our very close friends. And we will think of the past at that time. And we will wonder, how have I lived? Were the things for which I sacrificed really worth it? And we will experience something. We are in the bed. Our loved ones are around, but there is a veil between us and our loved ones. You cannot see it, you cannot touch it, but the dying know it is there. We are the ones who are leaving. And they are the ones who are staying. And after we are gone, they will continue living their lives as they should. And at that time, we might look around our room, wherever that may be, and see the things, the awards we have accomplished, the things we have accumulated, and assuredly, we know we will leave those things behind. But if God is the center of our lives, we will not face death alone. For only God can stand inside of that veil only God can stand inside of there. Christ has been there. The Spirit of Christ knows that each of us faces death alone or not. Or not. For the promise of God is, I do not forsake. God can stand with us. Only God is that which we take with us. Or better said, only God can take us with. Them. Jesus is trying to get people to wake up and prioritize life and living in light of your mortality, in light of my own mortality. Because when we embrace our mortality, it becomes very clear what is important. The priorities we make, we will sacrifice for those. And somehow the transient parts of life seem just less important. And Jesus is hearkening through the voice of the Spirit, asking us to ask the question in all that we do think and say, is this worth it? Is this worth sacrificing for? I believe family is worth sacrificing for. There are many things that are worth sacrificing for. Love. The beauty of living, drawing breath in this life that we have. That's worth it. But it never should be first. Seek ye first 
the kingdom. The rest will be added. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.